you know, in our world, you know, you may say, oh, you know, I'm, I've just come from meeting great, I spent 20 years with great Buddhist masters, Tibetan masters, you know, they really discovered, like, you know, the Dalai Lama, that compassion and altruism is at the heart of life. You will say, well, okay, you know, I'm, I'm just not like that, and, and there's nothing much I can do, this is, I'm a mixture of quality and defect, take it or leave it, that's how I am. So it's very important to show the possibility of change, of cultivating altruistic behavior and motivation, just like we cultivate another skill, you know, like to play a music instrument or, or, or learn how to solve mathematical equations. So can you cultivate those qualities? So meditators, of course, since 2,500 years, they found that yes, you know, they, they testify for within their own experience and hopefully other people will also testify that they become better human beings. But now, first of all, it's linked with a particular tradition, in that case, personal case, Buddhism. So no, as the Dalai Lama, as as the Dalai Lama often says, there is no religion that will satisfy everyone, and no spiritual path. So we need something that is more universal, more basic, linked with our basic human nature. So we all have a mind. We deal with our mind from morning till evening, and the mind can be our best friend, our worst enemy. Meditation is about cultivating different states of mind, becoming more aware of what's going on in your mind, positive emotion, negative emotion, using antidotes and so forth. But still, that's part of the practitioner. Now, in our world, we need also the dialogue and the collaboration with modern science is indispensable if you want to present a secular way that can be used in schools, in education, in jails, in the workplace, in, in enterprises and companies and, and so forth. Otherwise, people will always say it's this kind of exotic stuff, good for you if you do it. You can do yoga, meditation, that's your, but that's not relevant to society at large. So I think that the last 25 years or so, there's been increasing levels of cooperation and, and collaboration, research collaboration between contemplatives and neuroscientists, psychologists, social workers, and so forth, is a tremendous contribution to society. First of all, it clearly shown uh, that as neuroscience has discovered itself over the last 30 years, that the brain was taught initially to be when you are adult brain, it cannot change anymore. It's so complex that any change would make a huge mess. Now that has been shown to be completely false. The concept of neuroplasticity shows that no, the moment you are exposed to something new, whether it's juggling or playing chess or meditating on compassion, you start right then, within a few hours, to induce a change in your brain. It can be functional change, you know, more rapid connection between different areas, more connectivity, more traffic on certain neurons. It can be also a, 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 a structural change. There are more connections, physical connections, more new neurons being formed in some areas of the brain. The, the volume of that area might increase, you no know, more white, gray matter, whatever, physically increased. That's been shown with London taxi drivers who have to memorize 14,000 street, the area connected with topography, representation of the outer world is vastly increased. So the same thing was found with meditators. So that concept of neuroplasticity is that we can, sh the brain change until we die through any training, any exposure to new novelty. So meditation, of course, is a training and novelty in the sense that you keep on practicing more and more. So within a few weeks, you know, the studies done by Richard Davidson, Antoine Luce, Tanya Singer, many others, have shown that, yes, your brain change structurally, functionally with training. And it does so with meditation, whether it's on attention, whether it's on compassion, loving kindness, all that change a lot. So that means you can change as an individual. And even more so recently, uh, the, the uh, a collaboration between Richard Davidson and the Spanish uh, geneticist, uh, Perla Kaliman, have shown that within eight hours of practice on mindfulness and compassion, you can induce a different expression of your genes. I mean, we all have the genes that we cannot change the genes, but it's like in a building you have a hundred light bulbs, you can light 10 bulbs or 100 bulbs. And if you let only 10, the other 90 are just sleeping there. So likewise, 
A gene can be turned off or on. And if you have predisposition to stress and fear and anxiety, if that gene is turned off, then you don't have that anymore. So it, it is a very wonderful uh, avenue of research. A new f huge field in genetics is the expression of genes. Because even you have the genes that you get from your parents is like a blueprint. But what you do with that blueprint, that's called epigenetics. So you see, by changing the brain, you also change the physiology, all the hormones and the stress reaction and so forth, the health. Hundreds of studies now have shown that mindfulness-based cognitive therapy or re stress reduction has a huge clinical implication. Loving kindness also show the same. It, it affects on the, uh, on, on the you know, your level of peace and, and health also, and the vagal tone and all, all, of, all other kinds of wonderful things. And you can also modify the expression of your genes. So this whole picture of change is has been shown through this collaboration with science.